Okay, well, hi everybody, and welcome back to the Bandwidth Kaleidoscope Ears, and uh, featuring my good friend and guest, James Corbett. How are you doing today, James? Not particularly great, but uh, I've been worse. I have a yeah. little bit of a sniffle. Oh my god! Oh, oh my no. god! Oh no! Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'm, uh, you're a real trooper for, for coming through today and doing the podcast, and I do appreciate it, so thank you for that. Um, today we are looking at, we're, we've changed tracks, and you had such a great idea in the last podcast, something uh, to, instead of going back to the first album and picking a song off, you suggested we go through the singles in chronological order. So great, and you being James Corbett, you like to go for the unthought about one. So this is the B side of Love Me Do, and uh I guess this is their, yes, their first uh, release single. Is that correct? That is indeed correct, yes. And by the way, it can be found on the uh, on the uh, Please Please Me record. It is actually on the album. So I might have it wrong about uh, when they started using, when the record company started doing the policy of, like, if you have a single, it can't be on the album uh, type deal, you know. Uh, uh, it, like, I don't know if it was a record... Uh, like a label policy per se it was kind yeah. of this uh, more of a norm certainly in the uk at that time um, right so it wasn't it wasn't particularly unusual but the beatles really held on to that throughout their career which in today's day and age and you go back and you realize well i have all the beatles albums but i don't have strawberry right. field and all these other like right. you have all these major songs yeah. that you don't have it's kind of it is a bit weird isn't it yeah, that's the reason for records like the Alyssa Marine, where they could drop a few singles on and, you know, do that. Um, I'm not going to have any opinions about anything today. All right? I'm just going to state the facts, man. All right? Because, <laughs> because the reason being, come on, James, let's admit it, we're both unsophisticated Americans. And, <laughs> oh, wait, you're not American, are you? <laughs> Only, only a Welshman would presume I'm an American. I mean, he's probably Welsh, right? <laughs> and no one knows what we're talking about, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, express an opinion these days and, you know, duck under the desk. You know, that's uh, that's we have talked about it before, but that is unfortunately what a lot of Beatles conversations online tend to devolve into, isn't it? Yes, and really, as a case in point, just go to the Beatles Bible, look up any random Beatles song, and then look in the comments section, and there will be the editors and correctors of the mistakes that they made, you know. Um, it's some sort of, like, uh, obsessive-compulsive disorder that people need to go through the effort of, no, I have to correct this guy, he, he did this wrong, he said this wrong. I don't know, but to me, like, as a content provider... I'm breaking my ass putting together all these music theory, you know, studies of Beatles songs. And it's kind of not pleasing to get, you know, the negative comment because I express an opinion. After all, the centerpiece of these podcasts is is actually the music theory or it should be correct. Anyway, so a uh, P.S. I love you. Oh, do you want to talk a little first about uh, some of the background around the song? And not a lot. There's right? not a lot. Um, I mean, uh so this, uh, the recording that we know came from the 11th of September, 1962 in Abbey Road Studio 2. It was, uh, I think the third attempt, um, to record the debut single, um, which of course ended up being Love Me Do. Um, and this particular session, because George Martin was not happy with Ringo's performance on the previous one, they got in the, the session drummer, Andy White, and Ringo was relegated to the maracas for this song. Um, which, yes, must have been particularly irksome to him, and he did express uh, afterwards that he was angry about that for a very long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably rightfully so. Um, but, and, uh, I mean, there's not a whole lot to say about its production other than, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll read a little bit of uh, Revolution in the Head. Um, cool, Ian yeah. Um, book, he way, says, really for example, um, McCartney's gift as a melodist is obvious in the bold range of his line, whereas Lennon's lazy irony is reflected in his inclination towards the minimal intervals of everyday speech, McCartney's sentimental optimism emerges in the wide rise and fall of his tunes and bass lines. P.S. I Love You, for instance, covers more than an octave, yet in its middle eight, which doubles as its intro, 
Lennon obstinately harmonizes on one note. This is, in fact, <laughs> one of the few Beatles records in which the vocal harmonies, including some unusually low-lying parts, aren't entirely convincing, particularly McCartney's line in the second and third middle eights. Ah, okay, okay. Um, I would agree with some of his look at that, and uh, that little underneath harmony that John does on each word, you know, I'll be coming home again to you, you know. I always felt it was a little uninspired and actually a little awkward. So, oh, my God, that was an opinion. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Wow. But, but you know, look, I'm I, unsophisticated. I agree. So. I agree. It is kind of, it does seem a bit lazy or something, but... I will defend it in saying it's like uh, everything the Beatles did. They, As far as I know, this is the only time they did that approach to harmonies. So it is kind of a unique thing. And it certainly stands <laughs> out. Yes. When I think of this song, that's probably the one thing that I've always noted and remembered about this song is, yeah, that sort of harmonizing on the one word in each line. It's it's kind of weird. Um, yeah, it's not particularly successful, <laughs> but it's an idea. It's a, it's a new idea, and that's, you know, right out of the gate. There's the Beatles doing something that doesn't seem like it's been done before. That You know, even the Beatles, I don't think they ever repeated that concept again. I can't think off uh, the top of my head, anyway. Yeah, like I've said, I've mentioned to you many a time, one of these days I want to do, like, a podcast about Beatles firsts. The, the introduction of something in a song that no one's ever done before. And you could go through their whole history, like the early days, and find first there, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, Ron Richards produced this and not George Martin. And, you know, well, I have to give a little bit of credit to the critical commenters sections in the Beatles Bible, because uh, Beatles Bible, because... Uh, Somebody said that Andy White is not actually playing drums on this. He's playing wood blocks. And if you listen to it closely, that's what's going on. So that was quite the correction. I listened. I mean, the production isn't that good. It, it's, you know, really early primitive production. So it's it's really hard to discern. But it really somebody said, really, he's playing wood blocks. I could have sworn I heard like a. Um, a rim shot and a hi hat, but I listen to it close. It sounds like maracas and it's the and same Woodcock. effect ultimately yeah. as the rim shot yeah. hi hat. But yeah, yeah. So, um, before the com the correctors get in on you here, let me just insert from uh, the Complete Beatles Chronicle, Lewison, who says uh, Ron Richards took charge of the session. George Martin only arriving midway through, so ah, he okay. he was involved at some point, maybe in the recording of this song maybe not you, then i find it interesting i guess i don't know the beatles were too uh fresh and new to have any power to say oh we want this and not that um i'm surprised that he put uh let me do on the a side because that was the one that he wasn't impressed with right you know and uh, i think so yeah uh, i'm just going from memory but i believe in tune in i think um uh, Lewis and goes through the reason ultimately that it ended up. And I think it has to do with the publishing rights and they wanted to be able to sell because they wanted to get Lennon McCartney publishing so that they could sell it to, um, cause they were looking at that as going to be a major. Anyway, there's a whole story about that. So I think there's a reason why they ended up going with love me do rather than how do you do it? Which was the song they were that George Martin was pushing for them to be their debut signal single. Yeah, uh, they, they, their original impulse was to become like a songwriting team and peddle their music to other artists. Was was that the... the well, the, yeah, that that was because, yeah, they, ultimately part of the reason that they that Love Me Do even took off was the results of this man whose name I'm not going to remember off the top of my head who, was, who had some sort of finger in the publishing pie and he was excited, oh, okay, so a couple of songwriters, I can get in on sort of the ground level with them. So he was mm -hmm. trying to pump them up, and he was a large part of the reason why Love Me Do took off as a single, because <laughs> let me put my opinion out on the table. I don't care if people don't like it. I think <laughs> Love Me Do is a crap song. <laughs> it's terrible. I don't know how it charted at all. I guess yeah. maybe in the context of 1962 it sounded different or something, but I think it's a terrible song, and... 
It's I'm glad they survived that and went on to do what they did with the rest of their career. I will tell you from personal experience, I do recall as a kid hearing that song on the airwaves and uh, God, I must have been about like eight years old or nine years old. I remember hearing the song and I do have to say that it did sound different. It did sound unusual compared to the, the kind of airplay that was going on in American pop. So, um, yeah, yeah, so. All right, so um, before we get into it, there's this this theme of, you know, Paul talked about, oh, it wasn't, uh, what was his girlfriend's name at the time? Was it Dot something? Um, some people suggested he wrote that to his girlfriend, P.S. I Love You. Um but he disclaimed that what I find what I really, really am impressed with about the early Beatles is um, just as their fans were loyal to them, they were loyal to their fans. And in Hamburg, they would personally write back to their write their if they got fan mail, they'd write back to these people, which I thought was had showed so much integrity. It was really cool of them to do that. They didn't have to, you know. So I, I guess as they got bigger and more popular that, you know, they couldn't handle that task anymore. But I think it was really cool that they acknowledged their fans and gave them some love, you know. Even the like the Christmas albums that they would do is really just for their fans, you know. I, I just like that quality in them that they really cared about their audience. Um, yeah. So anyway, let's get into the meat and potatoes of the music theory of this. Um, all right, so first of all, what the, the, the real thing to talk about is the first eight bars, the introduction, okay? That's where there's a lot of, well, there's just one chord, actually, but it brings up a lot of cool stuff. Uh, one chord to think about, I mean. Uh, when I first heard this song, uh, I heard the second chord that comes up as an augmented chord, because the Beatles were very big on augmented chords. And what an augmented chord is, it's a major chord, root third fifth, where the fifth gets raised by a half step. Uh, and you can hear that in a lot of, uh, whenever I, it starts off with an augmented chord. Um, what song is that? All I Gotta Do. Um, so when I heard the song, I heard, letters and my love to you all right uh but you know another kudo to another commenter somebody uh i think somebody no it, i don't know where i got it from but somebody said no it's a d flat major chord as i write this letter is it a major or a seven Dominant well that's the fascinating thing uh it sounds like the triad it sounds like the three note chord but the melody note is the flat seven, which I it's cool. That's cool right there. It fills it out. So, you know, what's interesting, too, is, well, we'll, we'll get into it. But uh, I, another chord it could have been is the diminished seven chord. Um, now, what I find fascinating is when I did research on covers for the song, I saw someone do, oh, sorry, uh, play a D-flat 7 there, right? Uh, that particular inversion does not actually cut it very well. You need, the, you need to hear this, right? Uh, another person I saw do, they did the augmented chord. I saw another person go, they did the diminished chord. Yeah, right. now, it's I, interesting. No, okay, okay. So let me be the, the layman here, because I was looking at this and thinking, what? How on yeah. earth does that fit in? And the only thing I can think of is tritone substitution. Of course, right? That's the first thing I thought. But the, the tritone substitution... Mm. All right, if you take the seven notes of the scale and build a seventh chord on all seven of those notes of the scale... They'll all be secondary dominance except for the four chord, which turns out to be a tritone substitution. 
But that's a mysterious one, okay? It doesn't quite function like a tritone sub. It's it's weird. In other words, if I went, if I unpack that tritone substitution, and what is it substituting for is a G7. So. doesn't do anything it, it now if it was a bluesy song like that would work so there's no blues in here all right but yet this D flat chord is intimately connected to the blues all right um, I'm gonna go to the key of D up here with bar chords so you can hear the resolution of uh, G7 to D7. Now I'm going to do the tritone substitution of G7. Now that may sound familiar. To party at the county. This is, this, it comes up in rock and roll all the time, that half step up. Right. As you know from your study of the tritone substitution, normally it travels downward. All right. It, it resolves downward. This is resolving upward. That's strange in and of itself. Um, and I remember when I discovered in um, what's the White Album song? Um, uh, the, oh God, my my memory's failing me. What's the 1920s style? Uh, honey pie, right? Honey pie, you will make me crazy. I'm in love. That half step up blew me away when I first heard it, and I thought to myself, that's never been done in a Beatles song before. In fact, I've rarely heard any composer do that. And it turns out, well, P.S. I Love You has the same thing. Um, yeah, so this is cool, okay? Now, how it relates to the blues. Let's talk about that for a moment. We all know that the blues convention is you flat the third of the melodic line and then raise it up. All right, so that, we're in the key of D and this chord, It flats the third, so you get a little slight bit of blues in there. All right, um, <clears throat> now I want to go on a little bit like music theory philosophy here for a bit. Um, years ago, back in New York City, I studied a martial art called Xing Yi, which you just recently learned about, right? And it had uh, basically three levels, and the first level was learning the five elements. Uh, which is just these five basic moves that are, you know, the Chinese five elements, uh, water, earth, metal, wood, and fire. Um, the second level was called 12 animals, and that was much more complex because now when you do an animal form, you're incorporating two or even three of the elements that you learned in the first level within one action, right? So you could you could equate that to the Greek modes moving up to... Uh, the major minor key system, which became infinitely more complex than the Greek modes, just because of one slight little tweak. So it's similar in that sense. Now, interestingly enough, at the top level was something called double butterfly, in which there were two moves. And you learn the two moves, and then the rest was you just improvise. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. It's crazy stuff. Uh, you, I cannot tell if this is serious or not, but I'm with you. Totally, it's totally serious. Totally serious. Double yeah. butterfly. All right. Yeah, double butterfly. Well, it's a very Chinesey poetic mm. thing to say. I mean, you know, it sounds like a, a dish. You know, like sounds a Chinese like a John all. Lennon solo album or something. Yeah, oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Uh, but the point being that everything becomes immensely simplified at the very highest level, but you have to achieve a certain level of mastery before you could even touch that stuff, right? Uh, so in music theory, I would say the first level of Xing Yi, the five elements, would be the Greek modes. The second level, the 12 animals, would be like the major minor key system. And the top 
what, what I call the yin yang of music theory, which is diminished seventh chord versus augmented triad. And as that relates to the scale, you have the diminished scale as opposed to the whole tone scale. Okay. In other words, the, the diminished seventh chord relates to the diminished scale, obviously enough. And the uh, whole tone scale relates to the augmented chord. Now, let me, so you can actually hear it rather than speculate up in the air about all the theory. It's best to hear this stuff. So, um, if I do it, like if I'm in the key of A minor and I replace the 5 7 chord with the diminished seventh chord, and by the way, if I take that diminished seventh and add an E in the bass, I have something called an E7 flat 9, which is. Right? All right, so um, now. So once again, the diminished seventh resolution, A minor. So against this chord, I would play. That's the diminished scale, okay? And finally, you get to resolve, right? Uh, now that. The reason I brought up the flat nine is because that could be the five seven chord resolving to A minor. E seven flat nine can resolve to A minor. And the very top of the E seven flat nine chord is indeed this diminished seven. So there's a close relationship between the two. Now, the other option is I could do an augmented chord. In this case, an augmented with a dom uh, flat at seventh, but still an augmented chord. And it too resolves. However, the nature of the diminished seventh is that it's, it's being built. If I were to build it on one string, you could see it. Step and a half, step and a half, step and a half, step and a half. Right? Whereas the augmented chord is the exact opposite. Instead of building in step step and a half intervals, it goes in two whole step intervals. So you get uh, um, okay. Now, because of that obtuse raised fifth in that chord, all right, it kind of relates to the whole tone scale. So if I were to play this chord. Right, there's a whole tone scale resolving back down to A minor. Okay, so as opposed to so these I consider the great yin yang of music, the very top, the double butterfly of music theory. Okay, that's that's just a vision I have about it. It may or may not be true. It's probably not true. It's just my kind of philosophical vision about it. Um, yeah. So, that, so to that ask the I dumb question for the average Joe in the audience, how does this relate for that to that D flat going to the D? Right, because I heard it when I when I when I discovered it was a D flat major. Right, I thought, well. <laughs> the augmented then the D flat and then the diminished I just tried it on for size all three and I thought well they all work and then it was really serendipity when I found three different presenters of the song do each one of those chords so uh, what I want to do is maybe take a look at um, I'm gonna do a screen share here and take a look at the comparison of the three chords so we have uh, in the center is the D flat seven chord, D flat, F, A flat, C flat. We have to call it C flat. It's a B note, but by nature of building in thirds, it must be called a C flat. Okay. Uh, does that compute? Yes. Okay. You know, if I were to build a D minor chord, it'd be D, F, A, C. So right. in other words, that, that seventh would have to be some form of a C. So when the C gets flatted, it has to be called C flat. 
All it's, right, so and now, the harmonic with B, as we musicians say. Right, exactly. <laughs> good, good, good. All right, so if we look at the D diminished 7, and notice it's not a D flat diminished 7, it's a D diminished 7, uh, we get the really, really important top notes of the D flat 7 chord, the 3rd, the 5th, and the flat 7. Okay, when we look at the D flat augmented chord, we get the root and the 3rd, the flat 3rd. Uh, no, the third. Yeah, the third. All right, so what these all three have in common is this F note. And what is the F note? It's the blue note. It, what gets you, it's what gets you that. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's the relationship of the three chords and why one could replace the other. It's possible for one to replace the other. So, um, D flat, D augmented. I mean, uh, D flat augmented, and then D diminished. I like the okay. sound of that diminished resolving, but I don't know if you could get away with it repeating over and over in the song like this. Right, and uh, speaking of repeating over and over, this intro is reminiscent of the... Uh, Chorus, I guess you'd call it. All right. Now, the interesting thing there is, why didn't he bring in the D-flat chord in that? Because it's the same as the intro. The melody changes, okay? So, this... That B note, right? But but when he sings, um, now you can have the D note, the D flat chord. Da, 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 wouldn't work. You couldn't have the augmented chord. Da, 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 da. It's, it's just not working. Could work on the diminished seven. Da, 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 because there is a D note. But I'm sure he wasn't thinking all like that obviously uh you know um yeah he uh, he wasn't thinking like that of course you know he just thought okay well i want to change this melody but i can't have the d flat so i'll just stay with the the main chords of that progression the g and the d and i'll i'll work with that so yeah um th the d flat triad really has me perplexed i just don't really understand i mean another way you could go with this aside from the kind of heavy music theory approach is to say half steps are, tr are drawn a lower half step is drawn up to a higher one so i mean as a matter of course i mean i could play a full 12 bar blues and and approach every chord of the blues by a half step below <laughs> Natural half step gravitation is probably what's really doing the trick here. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense, but <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, really, I mean, the, the, again, that's the mystery of root and the mystery of uh, of the gravitational attraction between notes. How how does that happen at all in our in our brains? We just kind of interpret it like that. Um, yeah. So, uh, oh, uh, yeah, I wonder, let's get into the uh, verses then. It is the Aeolian Ascent with a Picardy third. Yes. And BTW, man, you know what? 
I decided to get formal with this alien ascent, and uh, about 10 minutes before we started this podcast, I looked it up on Wikipedia. No such entry. I did a general web search. There is no a Aeolian Ascent. It, it was just some guy's nomenclature for it. But, you know, whoever you were, guy, I like it. I, I like that the way you express that. I think that's a cool way to express it. It makes perfect sense to me. And yeah, uh, and I now hear it that way. So, yeah, good. Although, yeah. OK, yeah. actually, I'll say this. Um, there's a YouTube video up by some channel called Culture Sonar called The Surprising Influence of P.S. I Love You. And this person makes the uh, the assertion that this flat six, flat six, flat seven, one, as he terms it, um, is, I, I think he says this is the first time it is used in rock and roll. Um, but then he goes on to point out how common it becomes. I don't know. I, that seems surprising to me. It may be, I guess, the first time it appeared on a rock and roll record. But at any rate, um, yeah. it could not have been a new concept at that time. No, it wasn't a new concept because they were doing it at baseball games. You know, the organ would play da 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 you know. So it wasn't a new concept, but it may well be. I'm going to have to really start listening to early 60s music and see if I could detect anything like that. But it may well be the first time that a pop music band did do that, yeah. Well, I'm guessing the Beatles weren't listening to baseball organ music, so... Yeah, they weren't. They weren't. But I'm sure that turned up somewhere, you know, I mean. Uh, and it's funny, too, because I think in later years, Paul figured out the, the almost comical nature of that chord movement. If you do it the right way, it's comical, you know. Uh, so, you know, the Billy Shears thing, ergo, right. Uh, but what else is it besides the Aeolian Ascent? Have any your ears directing you any place? Uh no, what else could it be? What always comes up in every one of these podcasts? Oh, the parallel relative switch. Yes, really? yes, hmm. okay. yeah, yeah. That's when you hear an Aeolian ascent, just immediately associate it with it is the parallel relative yeah, switch. Yeah, that makes sense actually. Yeah, I've never put it in that context, but it makes sense. But just to prove it, uh, we're in the key of D. To go parallel, you change D to D minor. To go relative, you find out what key is D minor the sixth chord of at the Aeolian step, and that would be the key of F major, whose four chord is a B flat, whose five chord is a C, and approaching the D. So yeah, that's the Aeolian ascent, which is a, a, a subset or a, a just an expression of parallel relative switch. Approaching the D was the alternate uh, title for this, but they went with uh, P.S. I love you. <laughs> right, of course it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, now there's only one other thing. Uh, oh, by the way, um, the, the, the underlying harmony that John does, um, it's just him singly, I believe. Paul is double-tracked. I, I did an isolated vocals look at it, and Paul is double-tracked. Perfectly done, by the way, just beautifully double tracked because uh, he has to replicate his own performance twice, right? Uh, but uh, when we get to the. Um, oh, God, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could sing. That's actually three part harmony, and they're, they're actually laying out the full triads of G and D. So I, I didn't go into it. I didn't pick it, you know, uh, uh, with a fine tooth comb there. But uh, since the melody note is D, I'm assuming a tight triad harmony. You could hear in the lowest voice, as I write, as I write this letter. Send my love to you. And the other one, as I read this letter, send my love to you. Blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, there is some uh, very, actually very nice three-part harmony. Paul, John, and George. Um, ex well, after all his years in Hamburg, I guess, you know. Or all his hours, I should say, in Hamburg. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, this song was apparently written 
in Hamburg in 1961. Yeah, yeah, uh, very early, yeah. So uh, that's classic Beatles too, you know, on the fly, you know, write the song in the van or at the hotel room or, you know. And so, you know, there was a time when I was entertaining a lot, some of the Beatles conspiracy theories and a long time ago, but, uh, you know, oh, Theodore Adorno wrote their music and blah, blah, blah. It's before I really went deep and, and really researched it. But uh, um, the fact that John and Paul had such crappy memories, like when they were interviewed years later, like the book Lennon Remembers should be called Lennon Forgets because he's constantly like, I don't remember, I don't remember. Um, but, you know, when I think about it, in fact, when I've done a lot of hurried work with bands and we're throwing stuff together and then, you know, that you move on and do something, you just, you do forget. You forget who did what where. It's very natural. So uh, at first I blamed blamed it on the conspiracy theory. Well, they really weren't there to write it, so they, they, they're flubbing their facts. But uh, actually, no, they... They were there, and they just forgot. That's, you don't remember yeah. every detail of every song you wrote eight years ago? Come on. <laughs> right, exactly. And they were just so constantly putting stuff out. It's easy to forget. It's easy. What, what a body of material they put out there, you know. One uh, classical guy related uh, the Beatles' output to Schumann's song cycles and, and claimed that the Beatles' work was superior to Schumann, you know. So now when you hear the end of the song, do you feel anything's missing at the end? Yes. Yes. Thank right. you. I was exactly going to say that because I was, I, I feel it every time I'm waiting for that chord, uh, to come in and finish the song like till there was you. Da, da, right. Da, 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 da bring you know that right you, you want that yeah exactly <laughs> i'm waiting for that chord to come in and finish the song so i wanted to at, put you on the spot although I, apparently you've already done this but i what chord would be the resolution chord here what should they finish with well they played it okay could we all right can we just take like five seconds and we're gonna, i'm gonna risk a copyright strike here but let's take five seconds of the ending of the original and then I sent you the link for uh, the BBC. Then let's do the last five seconds of the BBC. Okay. So first the original, then the BBC. Because I think the Beatles even noticed something was missing. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, that so doesn't they, sound right to me. <laughs> that doesn't sound like the it, right chord. <laughs> anyway. Oh, you know they played a major seven. I played a six nine. Um, uh, uh, that's a, like a more along the line. But they do. They have ended with major sevens. I think the problem with this particular major seven is that it's not fully formed in the guitar. He's just playing a, an F sharp minor. If you listen to that closely, I think it might be George. And Paul is playing the D bass. But there's so much distance between these really high notes and the bass that it's not, it's not, that right. might have worked yeah, a little more yeah, yeah, smoothly, yeah, 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 yeah. you know? Yeah. It's the voice. But of, I'm, yeah. I'm so glad you noticed that, man. I'm really glad you noticed that because it was the same for me. It's like, Arr! yeah, it's not. It's not even like I noticed it. It's just like I felt it. I'm like, I'm, right? No, that is that isn't the end. That cannot be the end. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. So yeah, the Beatles, after the fact, decided, you know, let's put in that chord. And uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, you know, music theory wise and getting into the verse, um, most of the chords of the song are from the key itself. So we have D, one, uh, 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 E minor, D, A, B minor, A, uh, B flat, flat C D 
um, you know, again, if you if you listen to modern contemporary songwriters, they won't use like the chords, just simply the chords of the key you're in. It's not a big deal. They just follow really rigid patterns and repeat them, you know. And uh, this song, I, I love the way the chords move because it's I've never heard it. The standard chords of a key used precisely like that. That D to E minor, D, A, B minor, A. Just a very creative use of the chords. And I believe in Paul's case, he was just following the melody. You know, um, he just found the chords for the melody. Um, another, another song that I think is remarkable for just taking the plain vanilla chords of one key you're in is... Uh, I'm looking through you. It's just, he's using six different chords or something like that from the key and uh, just moving in ways that are atypical. But the thing is they're chords of the key so they won't sound atypical. It's just that the way they move is not the way a typical songwriter would do them. All right, well, let's talk about the vocal aspect of this because that to me seems to be the song. As you say, I'm not sure it's the, the chord movement per se. It's the sort of the vocal production mm -hmm. the harmonies like that's the sort of the flavor of the song mm -hmm. and the melody obviously as you say he was probably writing around the melody per se um now we had talked before when we were talking about the song and you said something about um the uh the the vocal interjections that paul does you know i want you to remember that kind of thing right did yeah. you find the source of that type of yeah, right. This is something to bring up because John offhandedly remarked, this is Paul trying to sound like the Shirelle Soldier Boy. And I looked up Soldier Boy and it sounds, first of all, Soldier Boy is a really uninspiredly produced song. I mean, I like the Shirelles, but I just think that was like the producer just didn't care or they were really tired because their vocal performance is not good. Um, I've been thinking about this, like, well, this was the time of teen girl groups, so they were probably teenagers. The producers were old guys, and they're going, let's just get this shit over with, you know. Maybe they didn't take it seriously, whatever. But all I know is... Um <laughs> it's a very uninspired song. It's uh, the classic 50s... Um, one six two uh, four five, and uh, this song sounds nothing like this. So I think John was just assuming something there. Maybe he was. Uh, maybe he said the wrong title. Maybe he was thinking of a different song. It could have been. Maybe it was a different song. Maybe it was a different song. Um, but uh, yeah, there's this. I no, I have not found it. There was this sort of. Uh, I was telling you about it. There's this genre of music in the early sixties, kind of pre Beatles. Uh, very American sounding music and uh, I can't think of a genre name for it because it wasn't like anything it was a little bit on the, you might hear acoustic guitar in it so it was a little folky maybe but yeah was... I, yeah not yeah but I know what you mean because um, here's my perspective as a as a youngling who was not around at the time but uh, yeah. the way I think of it is something like she loves you is whatever 60 years oldish at this point but it still sounds it sounds on the other side of that dividing line this oh. song sounds on the previous side this sounds like a former era yeah nicely put yeah yeah it does it does exactly and you know considering this is very early beatles well that makes sense it makes know? sense yeah i'm not faulting yeah. them for it it just yeah, you can yeah. feel this sounds like oh this sounds like something they grew up with or something they were listening to that they were trying to do yeah. that style kind of thing yeah and i could not i know one of these days one week i'm going to be cause i listen to internet 60s radio sometimes so you know one of these days i'm going to hear the song and go, oh that was it so you know i'm going to have to add a little addendum to this podcast <laughs> uh yeah, I, I ran some song titles through my head, and I simply could not find that style, you know. Uh, somewhat, maybe somewhat close would be Jay and the Americans. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, not quite sure. 
Um, the way I see it, that one, you know, I want you to, um, yeah, I write the sign of you, send my love to you, you know, I want you to, uh, that, I could swear is an exact line from some song. Yeah. You know. It sounds familiar. It, you know. And what I think it it is, is some white artists that like black yeah, artists yeah, yeah. that tried to emulate that kind of singing and yeah. that kind of improv, but it sounds more white than black. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's a, that know? is very much the vibe I get from this entire song. It's very square, very... Yeah. Um, as you said, you sent over a, a cover that's a decent, a very good cover, although the bass is way up in this <laughs> cover mix. <laughs> you cannot avoid the bass in this. Uh, by Dreamer Jazz 352 on YouTube. Um, small channel, but he does a great job sounds very good but as you said <laughs> when you sent it to me it's a bit dorky <laughs> but yeah, it's a bit dorky. to me that's kind of, the song is pretty dorky um the, yeah it's very square very straight rhythm very white and and yeah. the only thing that i heard i didn't hear that what i was assuming was a tritone substitution is kind of well that's a bit blue there's a blues right. thing going, but I didn't hear that. What I heard was the, ah, you know, I want you to, is like the one time they try to put something soulful into this. <laughs> right, right. And you can be sure that Paul came up with that and saved it for the last verse, which is classic Beatles in a way. It's like, I, I used to try to figure out Beatles formulas for songwriting when I was uh, in my teens, you know, and uh, they would... Uh, like slow, like with each verse, they might add something new into each verse as it as the song progresses. Then you get in their later years, they added a middle eight, and then you get the last verse, and that's where you you bring out the big guns, you know. And this song is sort of doing that, you know. He's giving a little extra energy to that final verse, so it has something more to hang on to by the time you get to it, you know. I I didn't go through the form, but it seems to be intro A A B A B and out. I think that's basically it. Yeah, it's very basic. For look, for a 19-year-old or whatever he was when he wrote it. That's great. Yeah. But considering this is Paul McCartney, it's not exactly among his top tier songs, is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, you could feel the youngness like you could feel the youth in it that he's still searching for, you know, I won't say his sound, he's searching for his immense genius <laughs> to come out um yeah yeah so um honestly james that's about all i have on the song i think that pretty um, much covers it i don't think we need to go f too much further into that one more little point i do want to make about this song is its simplicity it's it's very simple song there's nothing outrageous about it there's some cool little ideas, and as you and I have talked about before, the thing that makes Beatles great is the subtle little ideas that come through the piece of music, you know. Um, I relate this song, oddly enough, to a song like For No One, in the sense that this is like, I think it was, might have been McDonald in Revolution in the Head talked about that song as like a, as a, a like a chess game where you, you're perfectly placing your pieces. Each chord is a piece, you know. I feel like that about the song. This song is so simple, but I couldn't have written it, you know. It's 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 got a great melody too. Um <laughs> which is kind of, it has a wide range, and that's very McCartney, but to, to go from high to low is not so McCartney. Yeah. He tends to go from low to high, yeah. you know. I was just thinking that, actually. Yeah. And it, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it works for this melody. It it's works. Great. But yeah, it, is, it isn't exactly McCartney, is it? That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that's just Theodore Adorno, that's why. <laughs> but, but... You may not have been able to have written something so simply beautiful, but as a producer, you could have said, 
You need to resolve this, boys. You need a final chord there. How about... Beautiful. <laughs> you just improved the Beatles. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing about Paul's dorkiness is that he it never left him. He's always been a bit on the dorky side of times. Unafraid uh -oh. to be dorky when need be. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, Maxwell Silver Hammer, things like this, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, I will defend a lot of Paul's work, even the things that are considered the granny songs. I will not defend right. Maxwell Silverhammer. <laughs> well, I could find lots of cool stuff in it if we were to. Yeah. If we were to ever hey, it's got one of the. It's got the Moog synth synthesizer on it, right? So it's cool. <laughs> but... Yeah, but that. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, it could be. It could be good. It's not. Anyway, we're you... we're straying into opinion territory here, Booney. Uh oh. Yeah. No, uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Shields up, Captain. <laughs> oh boy. But uh, yeah, uh, just real quick, there is a line in that. Okay. Um, um, if I could find it. Da da da. That's one thing I like about that little move in uh, Maxwell, so. <laughs> anyway, so that does it for, well, I, I mean, technically, this may, is this their first single? Because uh, Wikipedia lists My Bonnie slash The Saints as the first oh, Beatles single, but that's yeah, Tony Sheridan, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Oh, they were the backup band for Tony Sheridan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't count. think that's a Beatles single. Anyway, no, so we skip that one. The next one, chronologically, will be Please Please Me slash Ask Me Why. And uh, do you have a... I think I do, but we'll discuss it. Mm, anyway. We'll discuss it? Yeah. Love you, woo, 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 crazy town, this is the one to know. Ba -dum -ba. Yeah, there's the Beatles going kind of loungy and doing the cha-cha-cha thing. Which, by the way, was getting popular in the early 60s. You know, the cha-cha was a thing. You know. Until Chubby Checker came along with the twist, and then I had my grandmother and grandfather in the living room doing the twist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Ah, the 60s. Ah, uh, the 60s. Gotta love them. All right. Well, that's right. for next time. I think we'll wrap it up here. Huh? Wrap it up uh, under an hour. We're too much short of an hour, if not... Uh, yeah. Wow, We James. can do it <laughs> on a can very short, it. very simple song. We can do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then I'll, uh, I'll see you next week. And uh, yeah, have a good one. And thanks for joining me today. And take care, everyone. <laughs>